Hey, Mitch, how are you? Uh, great, good. Um, it's it's, it's going to be a really hot day here. Um, and I'm kind of looking forward to getting outside and, and feeling the warmth. Know the feeling. Um, well, listen, thanks for, for chatting with me today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Greg Tapo. I'm a long-standing uh, education writer. Spent uh, 15 years at USA Today, four at the AP, author of two books on education and technology and trying to do things differently in, uh, uh, for teachers' lives. Um, and I'm really interested to chat uh, briefly today with Mitch, who's got some really um, exciting ideas that he's bringing to, uh, to the fore. Um, the first question I want to ask you is just tell us what the heck mind shifting is. Right. Nobody's really heard the term, right? Or they've heard it in many different contexts. So the, the way I look at it is uh, mind shifting is learning how to tap into the resourcefulness of our own minds mm -hmm. and inspire resourcefulness in others. So it, it, it creates a much more collaborative framework for individuals and for organizations. And, you know, there's pieces of this that have been explored in so many different fields, like, you know, cognitive science, behavioral mm -hmm. psychology, economics, organizational development, neurobiology, critical thinking. You know, they each have a slice about what makes us resourceful, how we can learn to be creative, how do our own minds get in our way, but nobody has put them all together. And so what I've done in the last five years is learn what works best from each of those different fields and put them together mm -hmm. in a practical framework. So kind of an example, you know, I think we've all interacted with somebody with whom we've had a strong disagreement over maybe probably something important such as climate change or gun control or abortion or inflation or the pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. and when we're doing that, we're thinking to ourselves, what could be going on in their mind that has them believe in something that's so obviously wrong. Mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, like no matter what we do, we're not able to convince them by arguing or by logic or by showing them data that shows that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, we just have to understand that they're thinking the same things about us. So what if we could learn how to think about problems, how to communicate, how to collaborate in ways that propel us forward? So mm -hmm. that's what mind shifting is. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and and I, one of the things I was gonna kind of add as you were sort of starting to describe it is that it feels almost like it's more important than ever now when we are in sort of high conflict uh, in a way we've never been. Um, to, let's let's kind of zero in on on the teacher piece of this sort of so if I'm a teacher like where do I drop into this how do I understand this and use this what's in it for me yeah so it's interesting because I think that there's three different things for teachers okay so number one is we all got into teaching or we all got into education because we want we like get such a thrill out of developing kids to think better and to grow up to be, you know, successful actualizing adults. I mean, that's why we, we love doing that. That's why we got into education. These are really the underlying skills that kids need to navigate to be successful and to solve the problems that are facing society. So that's like the big thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing you know, and I guess, and we don't teach those in school, right? And so these, you know, part of this is, you know, and here's how to teach these things to kids. The other thing is that, you know, we all face issues in our classrooms, like we wish, we, we pose problems and we wish kids could have the growth mindset that they'd learn from errors. We, we wish the kids could take responsibility for their own actions. We want kids to, um, when they start down the road towards risky behaviors, to be able to self-modulate and to move back from those risky behaviors. Well, these are the skills that kids need in order to be able to do that. So if kids had these skills, our behavioral issues and class management issues that we waste so much time for in class tend to diminish significantly. So that's the second thing for educators. And the, the third thing is that none of us are born with these skills. And whereas all of us possess some of these skills and we've developed them, maybe not in a methodical manner, 
but these are skills that are going to help all of us in life in a prof, in a, and in our professional careers. So, um, so I, I, I look at it kind of a threefold thing for educators. One is why we got into education in the first place. Mm-hmm. Two, it's going to make our jobs easier in the classroom. And third, it's going to make our own lives better. Nice. You know, um, I, I wanted to hear a little bit about how this all took shape, like how long you've been working on this and what was the the spark, if you will, for mm-hmm. for doing this work? Yeah, it's funny. It, I guess it, it started about five years ago as I was like increasingly frustrated by the fact that, you know, we just seem to be like bunny heads all the time as people, mm-hmm. you know, as a society. And, you know, started reading some literature about, well, how can we make sense out of situations? How can we shift our minds to be more creative? And I just received an email from somebody in Africa saying that they wanted ed tech entrepreneurs to lecture to their university students. Hmm. And kind of on a lark, I emailed back to this, the person who, who ran the university. And I said, you know, I don't really think that's what you need. Ed tech is going to be different in every country, but I've really spent some time in the last six months or so looking at sense-making and I could do like a two, two day, three day workshop for your uh, university students on sense-making. Would you be interested? And I got this message back saying, yes, could you come over here for a month? And I was in Niger and it was like, oh, I can't come over there for a month, but I'll tell you, but I could come over there for a week and I can mm-hmm. teach two sessions in the course for a week. And so we scheduled it for six months in the future. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, what do I get myself into? I've been reading these books, but I don't have two days of material for university students. So mm-hmm. over the next six months, I read like 20 books and I put together this course that really had three parts in it. The first mm-hmm. part is, you know, how do you control your own mind so it doesn't get in your way? The second part is, how do you look at, at situations so you're more likely to come to solutions and come to solutions with other people than, you, than we have been in the past? And the third is, how do we start off, in, how do we start off uh, solving problems knowing very well that the first thing that we're going to do is probably not going to be the one thing that completely solves the problem? So how do we, how do we go into problems and be much more flexible when obstacles present themselves and um, and when people oppose us. So those are those were the first. Those were really the three parts of the course. And I go to Niger and I find out that, it's, that this university, the whole purpose of it, is that Niger is the poorest country in the world. These are the kids who are going to then that they're hoping get the skills to be able to turn the country around hmm. and. So I had 70 people in each one of these two-day sessions. And what was thrilling to me is at the end of each two-day session, the kids just like stood up and cheered. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It was like, because this is stuff that that you you don't learn in school, but really you're going to help you for the rest of your lives. And that was like four, four and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm still in touch with about 20 of the, well, they're not kids anymore. And they were, to be honest, they were never kids. They were, you know, 20, 25 years old. But I'm still in touch with about 10 or 15 of them um, Mm. about the things that they're doing. So that's how I got into it. That's fabulous. And let's let's talk about the actual, the the course you've developed. Um, So can can you kind of walk us through it, walk us through it a little bit? Sure, there's, yep. yep. So, so, you know, it started as this two-day workshop. And so that was about 10 hours worth of material. And now it's grown to about 18 hours worth of material in the subsequent three or four years. And I've taught it about 10 different times. Mm -hmm. So uh, the course at this point has really four different parts to do. You know, the first part is the mind. Okay. So, you know, the beginning of learning is, you know, is going to be controlling the mind. How do you know when the mind is deceiving you, your own mind? How do you then realize it? How do you then get out of that sense of, of your mind um, deceiving you? How do you recognize when it's happening to other people? So how do you go into a more re- resourceful state? So that's like the first maybe three um, sessions, you know, three 90-minute sessions. 
And then the, the second part of it, how do, you, how do we frame problems? Because we often go into problems thinking that there's one best solution, right? And so once we find our one best solution, either an expert has told us about it or there's some rule or we've looked up information, you know, we think, well, now we have to convince everybody else that this is the right solution. But there are many solutions, there are many problems where there's many solutions that, are, that, that could possibly work. And then there's other problems where um, nobody has any idea how they're going to, you know, what's, what's going to eventually work out. And then there's problems where it doesn't really matter. The big thing is, number one, we have to get to safety because we're in urgent danger and we have to, you know, we have to get to safety and then we can worry about how we're going to solve this problem in the, in the long term. And so part of this is recognizing those different types of issues and then knowing what types of solutions tend to go better with those types of issues. So you could imagine a group of people getting together to troubleshoot where each one thinks, you know, there's going to be one right solution and they're going into it with different solutions. Now imagine those same people going into a situation knowing, well, you know something, there's probably 10 or 12 things that could work that could solve the problem. And it really doesn't matter which of those 10 or 12 we do, but the key thing is that we all have to be working from the same blueprint. So we just have to decide on one of them we don't really care which one so that we can plan and be successful. That's a very different type of meeting. Or imagine going into a problem. Imagine if we'd gone into the pandemic and everybody had understood this is something new and there isn't anybody who really knows what to do. And when, when nobody really knows what to do, the key thing is we've got to be trying things, obviously trying things that aren't going to kill us. But we've got to try things out, learn from them, adjust and try new things. And if we'd all been going into that, then you know, the, we probably wouldn't have been told, oh, you have to wear a mask. Oh, you can't wear a mask. Oh, you have to wear a mask. Oh, you should get vaccinated. Oh, you can't get vaccinated. Or vaccinate, vaccines work, vaccines, vaccines don't work. It would have been much more accepting of the fact that, hey, you know something? We're gonna be trying these different things. I'm gonna try the things that, that, that uh, the authorities recommend. I'm gonna try the things that I think work best for me. And we're going to learn from them, and then eventually we're going to get to success. So, uh, so that's the second part: is you know how do you frame problems, um, and then the third part is is you know how do you prepare to iterate? Because no matter what you do, well, first of all, the, you know if it's a big problem, the first thing you try isn't going to succeed, and also whatever you try, there's going to be obstacles that pop up that you're not prepared for. There are going to be people who get in your way or who actively oppose you. And some of those people who are in your way or opposing you are going to be people who you're going to have to work with or live with or have relationships with over a long period of time. So how do you deal with all those while you're preparing uh, over the long haul to be successful? So that's the, 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 the third part. And then the fourth part is we're all part of organizations. So it's not like we're working on this individually or even just with a small team. So where are the points in organizations where organizations are most susceptible to change? And how do we leverage those points? If we're building an organization, how do we prepare the organization to capitalize on information rather than just rewarding on, on uh, you know, through punishment, punishment? How do we prepare that organization so that the people who are doing uh, who are closest to the action have the authority to see through the things that they have to in order to, to um, make long-term success. And so those are really the four parts and they take place over really, as I mentioned, 11 90-minute sessions. And, and I should say, included in each one of those is not just, you know, here are this, here's the ways of looking at it, but here are some exercises that teachers can go through with their students in order to teach those concepts and those techniques to your own students. Oops, you're, uh, you may be sorry, muted. I, sorry, I muted myself because um, there's a dog and a toddler on the other side of my door. Yeah, the uh, advantages of working, of we all, yeah. all of us working from home, right? Don't, don't worry, they are supervised. It's not just a dog and a toddler. So, oh, you didn't uh, tie them up? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know. <clears throat> I was thinking about you know all the uh, all the possibilities, but um, so so I wanted to just kind of on the heels of sort of this really sort of detailed description and um, ask you a little bit about um, the evidence. Um, tell me how you know it works. 
So there's, there's two parts to that. One is like the individual things, you know, like the, uh, the concept of how you look at situations or how the mind works. You know, all of this information, you know, none of it is, is mine or very, very little of it is mine. Yeah. So my job has been to pull together things that, see, that, that have been researched, that are, uh, have been put together by people who are experts in, in, in their fields. So the individual things that, you know, I've only pulled things that have worked, but then, you know, how do you know the framework has worked? And you, just in teaching this 10 times to probably, I don't know, 80, 100 different people, I, the feedback I get is, you know, from teachers, for example, is like, you know, I took this class so that I could give my kids, um, into, get, my, get some tips for my kids to get them into the growth mindset. Or I, I, you know, I didn't think that they were really thinking critically and I wanted some critical thinking skills, lessons to teach them. But, um, but what I found was that I wasn't living in the growth mindset. And this taught me to live in the growth mindset. I've already used this in my own personal life. You know, I have now materials to use in the classroom. So I think that, um, so, th so the feedback I'm getting is that it really is making a difference in people's lives. And these are people who I've taught over like four or five years. So I'm still, I'm still hearing from the kids I taught four years ago. I'm still hearing from, from uh, people that I taught in the U.S. say two and a half, three years ago, like, Mitch, you won't believe this happened, but this was exactly from the course that I did this and, 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 and look what happened. So it's, it's, it's anecdotal. Um, I don't think I'll ever do this, uh, you know, $100,000 long-term blind study. Uh, but uh, I feel that these are the things that, that uh, pulled together really make a difference in people's lives. You know, do it enough times, maybe the NSF will get interested in one. Right, one of right. <laughs> yep. And they may be listening right now. Who knows, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so this is really interesting. And I, and I want to um, make this as, as kind of economical as I can. So I guess I'll just ask one more question. If people are interested, how do they get connected to this? So let me just uh, share a screen that people can see that mm -hmm. gives them the information. So here is a QR code and you see the URL on the screen. The mm -hmm. next class that I'm giving is starting, you know, July 12th, uh, seven o'clock Eastern time, six o'clock PM central time. And so there's a registration um, URL and, and, and QR code here. And then, um, you know, if you have a larger group or if you're just interested in talking to me, um, uh, Weisberg M on uh, Twitter, I'm on, you know, Mitch Weisberg, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, um, I'm mm -hmm. on email. And so people can find me very easily on the, on the net and just ask me questions. And I'm yeah, more than happy to talk hard to find. Me. I'm not hard to find. And so how, what, except, what except if somebody wants me to take out the garbage, I'm very hard. To, I can be very hard to find. I, I can't fault you for that. Um, um, so it starts um, uh, on the 12th. Um, what can people expect in terms of just time commitment? So it's 11 sessions, 90 minutes a session, same okay. time, uh, about twice a week. Okay. And, uh, and every session is going to be recorded. So if you do happen to miss a session, uh, you'll have the archives. The, the only issue with missing a session is of the 90 minutes, probably only 30, 40 minutes is, is me talking. Okay. And then people are going to be breaking into small groups and actually using the techniques to solve problems and then coming back and sharing and giving feedback to each other. So if you look at the recording, you know, you'll get me and you'll get sure. the people after they've come back, but you, you know, you'll just miss the chance of interacting, but we are going to be building a community of the people who are taking the course. So you'll be able to ask questions in, in the community website. Excellent. Um, maybe if you put that QR code up again, so people can take a screenshot of it. Sure. Um, I will um, wrap it up. Anything I haven't asked you that needs to be in the mix here? Um, you know something I would love, I would love you all. I'd love you. To, to be to take the course um, 